Hello and welcome to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards, and today my guest is Sophie Budd. Sophie is Director and Chef of Taste Buds Cooking Studio based in Highgate, which offers cooking classes, events and catering, and all things food. Mm -hmm. uh, Sophie has a distinguished career working in the kitchens of renowned chefs that include Rick Stein and Jamie Oliver. And I want to ask you a bit more about that um, later in the interview. Mm -hmm. Sophie has also had the privilege of cooking for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. I'd be interested to know if he cracked any gaps <laughs> while you uh, did it quite legend. Um, Kate Winslet, Andrew Forrester's family, um, EastEnders character Phil Mitchell. Yeah, yes. good deal. Yeah, good deal. <laughs> uh, a personal childhood uh, symbol for myself, Jimmy Tarbuck. Oh, yeah. Um, probably not many uh, non-poms won't get that. <laughs> and, and Mr. Bean. Sophie's also ambassador for the Food Rescue Programme, which feeds disadvantaged uh, people in Western Australia by rescuing um, perishable food from cafes, caterings and supermarkets. Sophie, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I gather that at some point in your career, you were actually the chef on Roger Taylor's, the drummer of Queen's 125-foot uh, mm. sailing boat. Um, that sounds very rock and roll, <laughs> was it? Well, look, I was 19, so I was a little bit naive. And yeah. um, so I don't know who I spoke to, but I always want... My brother had worked on um, on some big boats over in America as a deckhand. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, when he was a deckhand, Steven Spielberg was a guest on the boat. And, you awesome. know, I heard all this really cool stuff. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a chef. That'd be good to do. Yeah. So um, I got in, somehow got in touch with the skipper who lived locally and, um, and he said, well, to get some experience, why don't you sail with us from Cornwall to Mallorca? And um, so I joined the crew, cooked for Roger, and from memory, about eight gorgeous women. I don't Excellent. know if there were anyone else there. <laughs> <laughs> and I cooked dinner for him and his guests, and then we spent 10 days at sea. We motored um, from Falmouth all the way into, well, almost all the way into Palmer, and the crew wanted roast dinner for you know, to have that night. And just as I started cooking roast dinner, they um, they put up the sails, and of course, cooking on a boat that's at full sail is a bit tricky. Mm. And um, and so, I mean, she's a stunning boat to sail on, and, and so she killed right over. I'm like holding myself up in the galley trying to cook this dinner, pulled into Palmer, tied up, and the whole crew buggered off for a drink. And left, left me there on watch. On watch? <laughs> Did they eat the dinner? Came back drunk, ate the dinner. <laughs> all right. So. So, but at nineteen, like looking back, I thought I knew it all. But yeah, I was. Yeah. It was a. It was a big experience. Um, got on really well with the crew, and I grew up sailing anyway. So mm. it was. Um, I remember going for the test sail out on the Carrick Roads, which is, you know, Falmouth. Um, in the south of England. Yeah, southwest of, or in Cornwall, and it's. Um, it was blowing, or as we say in Cornwall, blowing a hooli. And um, and they were testing the rigging, and it was just the most amazing sail I've ever done, like 125 foot to start with, and just hanging on for dear life. And she was just, and they were testing her to the max. And these professional sailors, um, we went right out past St. Anthony's, and yeah, came back just invigorated. Like, that was just amazing. Told my dad, that my dad's a skipper, he was a bit jealous. Outstanding, <laughs> outstanding. Mm. So as I said in the intro, you've yeah. worked in some impressive kitchens, Michelin star, mm. um, Rick Stein, the famous fish um, chef, and, and Jamie Oliver. Mm. I mean, what's it like working in one of these kitchens? I mean, my only sort of reference point is um, like watching Gordon Ramsay on the TV mm. um, in his, you know, in his, 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 his episodes. And, you know, there's a lot of effing and jeffing. But what it does shine through is there's a big focus on perfection and excellence and, 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 and wanting the best out of the team to deliver it. Mm. Is, is that what it's like? Yeah, I mean, I'm, one thing I do miss now I'm running my own business is the big kitchen teams, the, the ad adrenaline. Um, yeah, you swear at each other and there's the height of in the service. But when the kitchen's cleaned down and you go for a beer, everyone gets on with each other. Yeah. And um, there's a real, um, really great connection. And I mean, I, I was also, um, when I went to work for Rick Stein, I was 16, so I was fresh at, at catering college. I said to my lecturer, um, I, you know, Rick Stein was my idol. I think it was BBC Two 
um, 7 p.m. Tuesday nights was his show, and I used to watch it religiously. And um, and my lecturer gave me this scrap of paper from an envelope, and it said Giza, and then this this number. And I called, you know, back then, super shy. Hello, can I speak to Giza? And this Cockney, the head chef, Cockney guy said, yeah, she'll come up, um, you know, next holidays, do a week's work experience. And uh, my granny lived up the road and they'd been eating there for 20 years at that point. You know, Rick's had the seafood restaurant for a very long time. And um, so mum and dad dropped me at granny's. Granny, granny dropped me off there in the morning. And um, I remember walking in the back door and the sous chef, um, Gareth, um, looked me up and down. I was wearing all my college whites, like a complete dork. And he just went, you're not going to last here looking like that. You know, took off my little white neckerchief and my white hat and um, gave me a proper blue apron. And, um, and they put me in the pastry to start with. I think some girl, right. I thought that's where I belonged. And um, I hate measuring things. It's just, I hate it. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad I did that spell because I learned quite a lot about, you know, basic pastry. But um, I used to go up in all my holidays and um, I remember calling Giza once and, and said, chef, I really, I don't like pastry, can I go on the larder? And he's like, sure, weirdo. <laughs> so the larder section what, what does that mean? It's the back of the kitchen and you start early, seven o'clock in the morning, and there's literally big plastic crates of fish that come off the boats on the harbour and you just gut and fill it all day and you um, divide up the lobsters depending on size and we had um, proper like bathtubs back then with a little bubbly water and um, and I'd be filleting like 120 lemon sole before breakfast and um, and I absolutely loved it but going back to my first shift um, I don't know what menial job I was doing picking lamb's lettuce something ridiculous for like six hours and um and they um at the end of the shifts chef said go go up to your room so i was staying in one of the rooms and uh, the first chef i ever worked with said never go home before the kitchen's clean and i said nope i'll stay and help clean down and help clean down and i can't remember what he said to me at the end of the night but he said um that was your test and you've passed right so i was in and, because um, you stayed with the team until yeah, the end. Yeah, and um, and then from from then, you know, and it was. I remember one girl working there towards the end, but it was all guys. And um, what was the culture like? Ah, uh, I learned swearing very young. I learned a lot of things. I don't know. All boys talk about in kitchens is is sex, drugs, alcohol, music. You know, like right. from sixteen, I just knew lots of stuff. <laughs> That you didn't know before. Yeah, not in sheltered Falmouth, yeah. no. <laughs> so if you look across the uh, some of the kitchens that you've worked in, which has been your most favourite and which would you say has been like the, uh, the, the best performing kitchen or, and why yeah. was that? I'd say Rick Stein's was, um, that was, that was my beginning, but it has to be at 15, um, which was the Jamie Oliver restaurant. Um, and 15 is 15 where? 15 Cornwall. Yeah. So that was... Um, 2005 to 2006 I think and that was I got a job as a chef de party so so what does what does a chef de party do you run a section so right. and um, the section covers depends so you could be on the larder, guys out there that don't know this. yeah larder pastry sauce and okay. starters um what else is there bakery and then on in that restaurant it was my my section was pasta gnocchi and risotto and um, so about two weeks before the restaurant opened, because it was still being pr pretty much built and renovated on the, on the edge of the cliff, you know, we, no one knew what the kitchen looked like. Um, we did all this drug and alcohol training because we were dealing with the trainees and all of the stuff, you know, that they yes. might, might keep coming with. So tell us about the trainees. So original, the original restaurant had 15, which is why it's called 15, but we started 15. with trainees. Yes. Um, and, but... The because of the dropout rate and statistics, I don't know. They started uh, fifteen Cornwall with twenty one trainees, and um, so they were between um, sixteen and twenty four years old, yeah. from varied um, like what you would call disadvantaged background, or I don't know what the politically correct is anymore. Um, so you had kids that had gone from foster home to foster home, 
Um, we had some young single mums, um, a lot of um, a lot of all sorts of issues, you know, drugs, alcohol, um, tough upbringings, you know, a bit of crime, you know, all of that mixed in. And um, and so what they do is they they train them at college for a certain amount of time to get basic skills, and then they do I can't remember the hours, but they do like four days in the kitchen, and they work alongside a qualified chef. So the kitchen always has a full brigade of chefs, yeah. and then the trainees come in, learn, and then towards the end of their year, there's I think it's a a week where the trainees run the kitchen and the chefs get a week off. And um, so at that point, they need to be trained enough and good enough to be able to, you know, pump out the food. So This was a Jamie, Jamie Oliver restaurant where they're yeah. pumping it out, so it has yeah. to be a bit <laughs> standard. Yeah. yeah. The good thing about his food, though, is it's not super technical. Um, you know, it's, it's more about taking care of the amazing produce. Like, we used to get these deliveries from Italy, and because they're sort of a month ahead in seasonality, and you just walk in the fridge, in the walk-in fridge, like, and they'd just be up to the ceiling, um, globe artichokes and all these amazing cheeses and vegetables that I'd never seen before. Like, I was like, what the hell is this? And we get to create the menu every day, obviously kind of aligned with the head chef and the sous chef. But um, I'd literally just walk in and pick stuff up. And I remember we got, it's before I really knew what truffles were. I knew what they were, but I hated them. I love them now. And the chef bought um, two takeaway tubs of white truffle, and then he took a week off, and he put them in my fridge and said, you know, put them on the menu. And uh, white truffles smell a lot worse than black truffles, especially if you're not a truffle fan. So I was like, okay, cool. So I put them on everything, and within about two days I got rid of them. And um, he came back and he said, how are you going with the truffles? And I was like, yeah, good, they've all gone. And his face just went white. I said, what the fuck? I said, what's the problem? <laughs> so each takeaway tub was £3,000. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Not to get rid of in two days. <laughs> right. Crikey. So these people have been having like... Ah, oh, gourmet experience. Gourmet, gourmet experience. <laughs> just because I didn't like the what smell. <laughs> but yeah, going back to... Uh, before, what was it about that experience that made it the best kitchen for you? Um, well, number one, I was, before I went there, I was lost as a chef. I was cooking stuff. I had no direction. Um, I'd just come back from London and really lost my way emotionally and kind of um, in lots of different ways. When I got there, I discovered Italian, like proper Italian. Mm. I was a pasta gnocchi risotto chef and by the way when I started out I've made pasta once I've never made gnocchi and my risottos got sent back so I was probably not the best candidate for that position right but I just learned and um just loved it straight away it was like wow I'm an, an honor in a past life and um so there's the Italian and then there was teaching again teaching something that I never even dreamt of I just you know thought that I'd just be a chef and then be, a, you know, I'd been a head chef on and off up until that point. And um, so I just, I loved, I loved the teaching. Um, it came with lots of emotion because these, these guys were, you know, they, you know, come in a little bit stoned one day or come in with a hangover or come in with, a, you know, mental health stuff as well. And so it wasn't just like showing someone something and they go and do it. I was showing them both um, visually and then having, you know, with all the different ways that people learn. And there was a guy... How did you deal with those guys um, dealing with pressure? Because obviously once you get... You were saying yeah. before, when you get into the middle of a serve, I can imagine it apex is out in yeah. terms of the pressure. How did you help those guys deal with that? Well, look, sometimes they can't and they need to just go for a cigarette and you right. just have to deal with that. Um, some just go home. Um, the, there is a support network outside the kitchen, so they had counsellors and um, training and development chefs, and that was the amazing thing. Is you can't just chuck them in a kitchen and expect it to happen. There was an office next door, and there was a whole support network, which was perfect. Um, and sometimes the pressure is is what exactly exactly what they need. Just get on with it, and um, 
and that's that's what a kitchen is you know sometimes you just you know you burn your hand you can't use your hand there's no one else to jump in for you you know you run out of something you blah 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 and you just have to deal with it on the spot and get it done and um I'm gutted I can't remember his name there was this lad and he came in one day and he was covered in felt tip drawing and I said what what happened to you and he goes oh yeah my little sister wanted to do drawing but we didn't have any paper oh wow I know so he had to draw her all over him <laughs> I was just that's gorgeous he was just such a a gorgeous lad and um and he, um, a lot of the chefs got frustrated with him because he was in such a dreamland all the time and, and wasn't really taking stuff on. And um, and I, I think it was, he had to do it 10 times and get it wrong and then he'd, get it, he'd work it out himself. And when I realized that's how he learned, just gave him space to, you know, F it up 10 times and then he'd get it and he'd just be so proud but that was frustrating because you have to just watch over and over again. You're like, oh, no, again, again. But, um, you know, I don't know where he is now, actually. It'd be good to track down some of the guys and, and see what they're up to. But it was, um, so I started the when the restaurant opened. And then my last day was the graduation day of the first cohort, so a year later. And um, it was just like, I mean, I don't have children, but it was like, you know, sending them off into the world. And, you know, they did come in and, geez, there were days where I just wanted to kill them all. <laughs> yeah. You, you, and especially in the beginning, you know, the chefs, did, we didn't even know what we were cooking, let alone teaching them to cook. They're like, how do we make this pasta? And I've got Jamie's books under the bench going, oh, no, what's Papadelli? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a year later, they're all really actually awesome chefs and... So we went from 21 and we had nine graduate and um, just so proud. And some of them went to New York and, um, and just, yeah, went into really amazing careers and literally came from all those backgrounds, were given a, an opportunity. And look, it wasn't easy. They really had to fight for it and turn up. And, you know, a lot of them had never had a job, had always been on benefits and to a whole lot of discipline yeah i mean a kitchen is pretty you know pretty full on yes um so to go from nothing to that is a pretty big deal wow so wh what is it about cooking and chefing that that, that originally drew sophie in oh uh, let's go do you want to go way back <laughs> well, what, 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 what started it off originally so my parents had a bed and breakfast when, um, so we moved to Cornwall when I was seven and um, we had this beautiful house on, a, on the end of a peninsula and my mum painted this sign, afternoon tea, clearly remember it with this, she was a bit of an artist with this teapot, put it down the end of the driveway and me and my friend Claire um, used to do afternoon teas on the patio so I'd make cake and we'd do pots of tea, it was like £2.50 for um, cream tea and so I started that but I used to drive mum nuts because I never measure anything and she got to the point where she's like you're only allowed to cook if you follow a recipe and we had a big Arga so I got Mary Berry's um, you know one of the original Arga cookbooks yeah. and used to do the recipes out of out of her cookbooks and um, and then so I did that and then to be honest one of the main reasons was um, I hated school and um, and I knew everyone was going to A-levels in Truro. So I thought, you know, I've got, got my first job, proper job at 14 in the local pub and the chef sort of took, I was a waitress for a day and I wasn't very good. So they put me in the kitchen to peel potatoes. And, um, for £2.50 an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the chef, James, um, just, yeah, he taught me stuff and he said, you'd be a really good chef. And um, so by the time I got to college at 16, I had quite a bit of experience in the kitchen. And, um, and yeah, and I remember, it was because I was bullied at school for, well, I went to seven schools, bullied at every school. So I literally went catering college and back there seven was... School. Seven schools, yeah. Right. Mum and dad moved house a lot. Oh, right. <laughs> it wasn't, no, we lived in Kent and then Cornwall. We yeah. lived all around Cornwall. 
Um, but um, yeah, catering college back then was for idiots, to be honest. Like, right. you know, the only Rick Stein was kind of famous, but being a, a superstar chef wasn't really a thing. And um, so when I went to catering college, there was a bit of a, well, you know, because all my cousins were going to university and going to be doctors. And um, the first day at college, I remember sitting in this huge room and the head of the catering faculty, Vince Falco, I remember him saying, the world's your oyster if you're in hospitality. And I was like, yes, that's me. Like, I always, in what way? Like, I just knew that I didn't want to stay in Cornwall forever. Yes. And that this was, this was my ticket, you know, around the world. I didn't really know where I wanted to go. But... Um, it's interesting you say that because... So, I came back from... Four, four and a half months in South America in 1998 and I, I had a fortnight fleeting aspiration to be a chef because I could <laughs> see how this skill could take me anywhere around the world and it didn't yeah. matter even if I couldn't talk the language I could cook for somebody yeah. so is that what you meant yeah yeah and kind of what was already planted was like the working on boats I, I had an auntie in Australia so kind of thought you know Australia and um, so this was 1998 the Olympics was a few years away. And so I had all these thoughts, but, you know, and because I've been working in a kitchen, I knew I was actually quite good at it. Um, that it was a, well, it was just, he said, he just said that, and I was like, yeah, cool. Anyway, he they called out the names for all the people in all the different courses, and they, they said the BTEC National Diploma, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, yeah, so Melanie Booker, Sophie Bird and I just went oh my god and then in the next the other half of my course they said Kelly Sobey and I went oh no like my two of the biggest bullies from the oh world. dear oh, no. <laughs> I was like why are they doing and I literally I was like I'm, I'm gonna go home you know I, I was at the point where I was like I'm, I'm just gonna leave I think I had a little moped so I was ready I was like ready to go I'm just gonna go that's it and we walked down the corridor and they walked up behind me and um, I don't know what we said, but it was all, all dissolved. They're like, oh, well, summer's passed and we're at college now. We became best of buddies. Far out. I know. Yeah. But, the, but again, so is it fair to say that the, the, the big pull of it was to travel and get out mm. of Cornwall and go and see the world and, and have yeah. a skill that you could... Yeah. I mean... Looking, I mean, anyone goes, oh, Cornwall's beautiful, and it really is. I love Cornwall. You know, there's, it's always got a place in my heart, and it's stunning. But when you're 16, it's like, it's a hole, and, you know. Remote. Yeah, it's always raining, and, you and know. Yeah, you've come to Western Australia, which is <laughs> <laughs> quite remote. <laughs> I love it here. Yeah. yeah. I'll ask you about that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. So how has your relationship with, with cooking and chefing changed over the years? Because mm. obviously it started off. Yeah. Like, you know, as you've explained, but how has it changed over the years? Because you've been chefing now for... I know. 20, 20, 22 years I've been working in a kitchen. Yeah. So I guess in the first few years, you know, I never knew seasonality. Like, you could just always order everything. And I honestly had no idea what came from where. Um, probably the turning, the real turning point was working for Jamie. And, and that was quite sadly only 12 years ago that I suddenly went, oh, you know, we get Cornish Earlies at this time of year. And then, um, and then diff and starting to understand the seasons because it was a seasonal menu. I worked in so many places where you just had that such and such all year round. Um, so that was that was a discovery, and then um, you know coming to Australia was another discovery because you know all of the native foods uh, were just magical to me. I, I had no idea that there was all of this other stuff that you could play with. So um, there was that, and and sort of I, I have missed this generation of gels, foams, and crumbs. You know when I do joint dinners with other chefs, they do all this fancy stuff. And I'm like, wow, what the fuck is that? And I do quite simple, you know, I'd say my my style of food is rustic, Italian, homely. Um, sometimes Good I look at, yeah, sometimes I look, compare it to others and, and I get a little bit like, oh, I'm, I'm not I'm not good anymore. But I'm it, that's for them. It's I've I've missed that era. 
Um, I love to see it and eat it and experience it. Um, and But for me, I'm kind of, I love the seasonal produce in WA. I love that we've got, you know, from Kalanara all the way down to Esperance, we've got such a huge variety all year round of produce. Um, but I think for me, I still, I still adore to cook. You know, Fridays is generally the day I'll be prepping for catering or dinners and I go in early and I just have a few hours in my kitchen on, on my own with the music on and that's my happy place. Like, oh, wow. I literally, you know, it was um, last Friday. I had a dinner on Friday and Saturday night and I just went in. I make a load of mess and, and cook stuff and, and that's really cool. Um, but sort of the, the journey I'm on now has veered away from just cooking um, and it's veering into, you know, the, the team building that I do and, and kind of seeing, seeing my strengths in a different way. Yeah. And especially as... How's that? Um, so, is, I, lo- I is love... Born out of the Jamie Oliver experience? Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Well, the reason I opened a cooking school is because I worked for him and that I experienced teaching and I loved it and I was quite good at it as well. Um, so when I moved to Perth, um, I went for a, I'd say I went for a run. It was like a walk. Um, in my head, I was running. <laughs> yeah. um, I was living in Mount Lawley and I walked past the cooking professor when it had just opened. Um, it used to be run by a gorgeous man called Peter, Peter Kenyon, who was an economics professor. Mm. And it was his hobby. And I remember knocking on the door and I said, ah, oh, um, are you looking for any other teachers? And he was a no to start with. And then he called me and he said, maybe you could do the pasta and gnocchi class. Pasta and gnocchi was Otto. And so I started to do some classes and then I did some more. And then he trained me up to, to run the business. And this was, he had email, but everything was paper. Right. All of the um, vouchers were on a spreadsheet. Like it was old school. And um, he didn't even have a website when I worked, was there. And he was wanted he, was to he his account to the ledger. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. His do- his desk was always just covered in paper. Yeah. And um, and so he was he wanted to sort of retire and and have me run things a little bit for me. So I got fully trained um, in the ins and outs of a cooking school. Mm. And um, anyway. Um, in the end decided to, to do my own thing and um, another chef there, Sonny Diacampo, who is, um, well, Sonny by name, Sonny by nature, one of the most amazing chefs I've ever met. We kind of joined together and, and started, originally started Taste Buds as a partnership. And, um, you know, before there was any bills, like, you know, we'd, we'd hire kitchens and run classes and have a ball. We used to do East Meets West and do like joint demonstrations and did cooking demos at festivals together. And um, and it got to the point where he was thinking of going back to the Philippines with the family because he's from a, an island and wanted the kids to have like a few years of island life. And my dream was the, the studio, like having a space, having a long table. I wanted a big space to cook, a commercial kitchen and a walk-in fridge. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, found it. In Highgate. In Highgate. <laughs> there you go. Was it um, was it a big was it a big exciting moment when you made it all happen? Do you know what I was petrified? You know. What were you petrified about? I had no idea what I was doing. You know, looking back, I'm like, far oh, out. What a you know, what a big. Um, I had a big dream, and I I honestly, you know, there's no rule book. There's no how do you start a business? I mean, there's lots of things that you can read, but um, I just fumbled my way through. Vince Gareffa, I told, I remember calling him and saying, this is what I want to do. And he said, well, I think there's this old butcher's shop in Highgate on Lord Street. And I went to have a look and there was this big display fridge that still had sausages in and it had been turned off for about four months. No. Yeah, it was gross. There was no power. There was literally water pouring in the ceiling, and I went about four times and with my next partner, and he's just like, "Are you sure?" I said, "Yeah, because I can have my long table here, and I can have cookers here." You see the vision. Yeah, and it had a walk-in fridge, <laughs> <laughs> and 
Um, and the poor agent must have been like, wow, she, how many times is she going to come back and look? And my accountant's kind of like a father to me as well, and he just said, you know, just do it. So I just did it. And uh, that was that five it. years, five just and a half do years it. ago. Yeah. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. And um, there must have been some ups and downs with it since then? Yeah. Was, you know, running your own business? Oh, continuously, yeah. Even, like, today. Um, I saw a friend there and I was like, it's just the unexpected stuff. Um, you know, like, my, my, van, my work van that I used for catering three months ago just died. You know, it's got... 10, 10 grand left to pay on it. It's going to cost 12 grand to fix it. If I sell it as it is, it's going to, I'll get three and a half, four grand. And it's just been sitting in the car park for three months because I've had all these opinions and I don't know. I don't know anything about engines. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just been like a... There's a mechanic out there. You have to come <laughs> up to Highgate and give you a hand. This hope is interesting. <laughs> um, you know, and, um, and staff, you know, staff come and go. Um, I've had, you know, I've had some really great staff that have supported me along the way, and you know, I literally, I said to one recently, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I make it up every day. She's like, that's clear. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, sort of in some of the highs of, of, of owning your own business and owning the cooking studio. Ah, oh, I've done some really cool stuff. So, well, Vince Graffa, um Who's Vince? Vit from Mondays, Monday yeah. Butchers. So he's him and my accountant have been my like Mentors. my dad's um, <laughs> um, kind of guiding me along the way. So when I was, when Sonny was with me, um, I think his words were for Chogham. He said, can you come and cook some sausages on the barbecue for Bunnings? And we're like, sure. Okay. Chogham being the... The big Aussie barbecue. So for got, the heads of Commonwealth. Yeah. 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 So we got on this bus with Russell Wolf, a guy with a didgeridoo, and a gear. I'm like, well, that's a bit fancy for cooking sausages. And Vince said that he'd bring an apron for me. So I was thinking like a butcher's apron. Anyway, we get escorted, we get there, get escorted to the civil tent. And, um, and then at some point Vince said, oh, you know, it's actually the tent that the Duke of Edinburgh is coming to and the Queen's walking past. I was like, oh, okay. And he gives me this apron and I open it up. I went, are you serious? And it's a black apron and white writing on it says, be my lamb chop. <laughs> so I put on my apron and um, cooked up all this meat. It was all kind of just for show. I had these gorgeous scallops in a shell. And uh, so the Queen was walking along. Duke of Edinburgh comes over and he comes into the little tent bit. And um, he comes up and I'm cooking the scallops, you know, flesh side down. And you, you have, you get... Um, given a printed thing of how to address them with diff like in different ways depending on I okay. can't remember the protocol yeah the protocol and um, he said because heavens forbid you just talk to them I know like. <laughs> <laughs> alright mate yes. <laughs> he said what are they and I went oh scallops your royal highness and in my head I'm going do you know what a scallop looks like and he went oh poor buggers and walked off and I'm just going <laughs> And because they can't eat anything, because you might poison them. Right. So Vince was trying to give them a bit of steak, and he was like, no, thank you very much. But it was a pretty good experience. Because you might poison them? Yeah. Because they, be. oh, you could be. Oh. Yeah. I never thought of that. Well, it's the queen, like, she has people eat things before she eats them, I'm oh, guessing. Wow. Yeah. And then, what else? So this, beginning of this year, I joined up with Don Hansi, and we did the backstage catering for... Adele and all her crews. So that was that was three days of between twenty to one hundred and twenty for breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the um, Subi Stadium. That was huge. It took me about six weeks to recover. I was just I don't I don't know how Don does it. He's just amazing. How do you mean? He's a little bit older than me. Right. <laughs> and he works. You know, he's we were just full on and. I remember it was he wasn't there. It was was it Sunday? He'd gone to do a long table in Bunbury for three hundred, and I was there with all the crew, and um, I was chopping something, and I just yeah took quite a lot of my finger off, and um, it was just before service, and we just had to get the food out. So I'm like bandaged myself up to put ten gloves on, trying to 
just trying to get everything out and I was meant to go out on the carvery and I'm like oh, I can't even leave the kitchen with this going on find someone who can carve Nat's this tiny little you know little girl she's not a girl she's a woman she's like I can carve I'm really good at carving I was like right out you go and um so yeah that was an awesome experience and um a couple of years ago I did the backstage for Sting and Paul Simon down on the South Perth foreshore and um Star. Yeah. You look up to. Yeah. I mean, two of my idols anyway, like I was brought up on Sting and Paul Simon. And um, so I had to set up the full marquee kitchen and um, was, took a lot of guidance from Don because I hadn't done anything that big before. And um, so it's day one, just before lunch, about to do lunch for like 100 odd people. And this guy walks up and he goes, um, oh, can I get a juice? And I'm thinking, shit, I'm meant to do all the right stuff for all the rooms, the riders. And I was like, oh, God, did it, was I meant to put one in one of the rooms? And I said, is it meant to be in a room? And he said, no, nah, no, nah, I'll just have juice, like, when you're ready. And in my head, I'm going, oh, my God, I don't know where it is. I'm going to have to go and find cu cucumber and stuff. I said, what, what do you want? Like, all fruit. And he said, mostly green with a little bit of um, apple. I was like, fine. I said, it's going to take us a little bit of time, so where are you going to be? So I'm going to sit under that tree over there. I was like, all right, buddy, um, we'll bring it over as soon as we can. He walks off. I turned to my friend Katrina, who was working for me. I said, can you do a jug of green juice for that guy over there in the blue T-shirt? And she looked at me and she goes, what, sting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, that can't have been him, really. And all his... All the crew were there just laughing at me. I was just so stressed and and he had a beard. Right. And that's all I've got. And he's quite small. There you go. I thought he was really tall. Um yeah, so that was that was that one. But yeah, really cool experience. At the end of the day they they're humans, like most of them are pretty down to earth and yes. and normal. What have been some of the uh, more trickier spots of owning your own business and what have you learned from that? Um, well, um, accountability, like it all ends with you and, you know, sometimes stuff does happen that's so far out of your reach, you know. You have staff that are doing a great job but something happens and then you have to deal with it. Um and not just passing the buck and blaming and going, oh, it's not my fault. Um, more, okay, well, how can we deal with it powerfully and take care of the customer and the complaint? And, um, you know, I did a dinner recently and, um, you know, the, the truffles I bought weren't very truffly. And I know it sounds crazy, but it's not something I would ever have pre-thought about. And so halfway through the dinner, and I, I was really exhausted. I was just you know, wasn't at my top, you know, performance. Halfway through the dinner, I was like, I don't know. I don't know what to do because I was putting extra on, but there was hardly any aroma or flavor, and I don't use truffle oil, so I didn't have anything to back it up with. And then people complained, and, and I was like, do you know what, you're, you're right, and I'm sorry, and I wasn't great. You know, I went to the table to talk to people, but I normally am a lot more out there and and have a bigger conversation with the table and I didn't do that um, and just looking back I'm like I should have done that 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 and that but at the time especially because I do push myself too much and I do get exhausted and you know it's all my fault yeah no one's making me yeah um, where does that come from <laughs> yeah it's a good question I've been discovering that lately it's just it's a prove like it, it goes right back to proving myself, you know, proving that I can do it, and especially being a female in a male environment, um, not from a like poor me kind of attitude, mm -hmm. but it's you. you ha I had to prove myself. I had to, you know, if I cut myself, just deal with it and not make a scene because if I did, I was a girl, and then I'd be like, oh, you know. And, um, and, you know, that's why there's not that many females in the industry, like at my age, because, you know, they have kids and, you know, they, they realize that it's, it's, and I did, you know, I was like, I can't be a head chef much longer and, and just do the crazy hours and work every weekend. 
um, and it's it's a tough game. And you know, I've got friends who have got incredible restaurants um, in Perth, and they are, you know, most of them are men. But I guess it, there's a few. There are a few chicks. In fact, one amazing woman is Amy Hamilton from Albany. Her restaurant. I haven't eaten there yet, but I've done a few events with her. And she's a mum, and she's got her own restaurant. And um, you know, I really admire admire her and that because it is very easy for men to go to work and the wife stay at home with the kids, and and they can have that career. But for for women, you know, I haven't got my own children, and you know, I've got my dog, and that's really yeah. <laughs> the only the only thing I, I need to look after. Um, so yeah, it's it's a proof prove myself and right. to whoever, I don't know. Yeah. Interesting, eh? <laughs> yeah, yes. Prove yourself to, you don't know yet. Um, mm, probably to myself as well. And I am wising up a bit now. And How do you mean by wising up a bit? Well, giving myself some more space and time and, and freedom. Because my my automatic is when things aren't going great, especially financially, it's just work harder, and it doesn't work. I end up being, you know, exhausted, like like I was at that dinner. And there's a big impact when I'm like that. There's an impact on my staff because I'm, you know, I'm not a cow in the kitchen, but I do get ratty and I forget stuff. And you know, some of my chefs, poor Richard, um, like sometimes <laughs> it's like, can you just you know, can you just follow the list? Or, you know, he's, <laughs> he's given me lists so many times, like the gear you take for catering. And I'm just like, oh, I'll just chuck it all in and, and hope for the best. And he gets there and there's, you know, there's no frying pans or you know, stuff like that. And then having to deal with, deal with that. But, um, yeah, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we were talking about um, approving yourself and who you're proving yourself to when you were saying you begin to wise up on that and, yeah. and the fact that you've um, got a bit lighter on yourself mm. and also I'm 36 and I'm I'm getting yeah I'm getting I get tired a lot quicker than I used to and um, I want to start taking care of myself like I I've lived the you know drinking a lot smoking cigarettes you know when I lived in London took quite a lot of drugs and you know I've kind of really pushed myself to the limit for a, a long time doing 80 90 hours a week non-stop mm. and and I think now now I in the last kind of probably 10 years I've discovered you know my mum's a real hippie so I've discovered that you know putting the right food in your body works and Jeez. Stuff like that. <laughs> That's quite funny coming from a, from a chef who works in the, yeah. in the industry. Yeah. But when people say, what do you eat? You know, if you ask me, I don't know, 10 years ago, I just, like, I, I've always known what was good for me. But would I do that? No. Whereas now I really make sure I eat lots of vegetables and, you know, and I am pretty healthy. I do love cake, though, which is, like, my big downfall <laughs> is, you know is sweet stuff but yeah. but generally especially I imagine if you can make really good sweet stuff as well <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm not very good at making sweets oh right it's like eating them <laughs> <laughs> mm. there we go so you're also um, an ambassador for food rescue mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more about that and yeah. how you got involved so I've known Julie Broad who runs food rescue for Uniting Care West for Pretty much since I've been in Perth, so probably about nine years, and she approached me, um, I think about four years ago, to be an ambassador. And what they do is, um, there's two full-time staff, um, just over 100 volunteers, and they pick up fruit and vegetables from mostly supermarkets, take it back to the warehouse, remove all the plastic, recycle the plastic, um, you know, break it into boxes so that a family or a charity will get a box of root veg or a family will get a mix of vegetables and fruit. So this is the stuff that's not been sold at supermarkets? Yeah, and look, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it might have a little bit of a mark and sometimes there's just oversupply. Um, sometimes I go there and there's just those big bins of apples. So or, I was going to say, what percentage of waste are we talking about? 
Do you know, I don't know what percentage of what's actually being wasted they get. It would be a tiny, tiny percent because, I mean, I mean, we're in Carnarvon recently. If you look at how much waste is, is happening there, what food rescue, I and mean, food rescue could grow huge. Like the number of supermarkets they're picking up from, I don't know all the stats I should do, isn't that great. Imagine if they were picking up from all the supermarkets every day <clears throat> and they then send those boxes to, um, they've got 80 charities that they take food to. And, um, and so I've been an ambassador for four years and, and now what I do with my team building is we teams this get... This is at the cooking studio? Yeah, so it depends. I, I do teams of 10 to 30 at the studio, um, 30 to 60 at Food Rescue itself. We set up in the warehouse. And then bigger teams, I go to Per City Farm because they've got two commercial kitchens and a huge barn that we can do massive teams in. And um, and basically they turn boxes of food rescue fruit and veg with, you know, pantry ingredients and some protein into as much food as possible. In two hours. meals. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's a competition, so, you know, they get judged all the way through. Um, and um, and then at the end, teams eat BYO beers and wine, sit down and eat together, and then stand up and pack up the all of the food. So um, a team of fifteen will make a hundred meals on top of what they eat. So imagine, like I've done, I wish I could remember, did a team of fifty or sixty with South South Thirty Two at the end of last year. I mean, like three or four hundred meals, wow. and then food rescue pick it up and then take it to whichever charity is open that day and, you know, looking for, for food. And generally it's pretty healthy because it's based on fruit and veg. Yeah. And um, so it's, you know, the possibility of food waste being used to feed hungry people. Um, you know, corporates love it because it involves teamwork, it involves cooking, eating, drinking, giving back to the community. And with for every person I donate $20 to food rescue as a wow. donation because obviously like I used to do them and just buy all the food now I don't have to do that I, yes. you know I, I give that as a donation to food rescue for as a thanks for being able to use their produce and um, and that's kind of like the the direction I'm going in now is to really push that and and to, to have a massive impact I mean since November I've donated nearly six grand to food rescue through the team building and they're buying a huge set of scales to weigh all the crates on. Yep. And so I'd love to next year be able to sponsor a van, which I think is like 12 grand. And every year as they get bigger, be able to make a bigger impact on them. Um, and they also have cargo carts. So they have corporates push cargo carts around the city. Oh, I'm really bad with figures, but they're, they're picking up thousands of rolls and sushi um, a week and then taking it to different parks and um, people are coming and collecting it and it's getting a meal. It's incredible the scale of food and waste that doesn't mm. get used. I mean, I watched the recent um, War on Waste yeah. program yeah. And, and just being aware of the fact that the fruit and veg that we get presented in the supermarket is always beautifully manicured mm. at all. You know, it's unblemished and what have you, yet there's so much um, fruit and veg that doesn't even make it to the supermarket. It's perfectly fine. Mm. They just might have a few scores on it. It's still fine. It's just yeah. been you know, scored by high winds or whatever mm. here. And, and yet... Yeah, and, and, and then even the stuff that doesn't get sold or the, the, the sushi and what mm. have you... Um, yeah, it, it, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how much of this is being influenced by supermarkets and what they present and how they <laughs> present it? And it's look, it is mostly supermarkets. And the thing is, like, they they serve a purpose, and they I get it that tomatoes need to look the same, but and then customers think, oh, tomato has to look like this. People are getting more educated. The shift will start to happen or is happening, but it's just a chain reaction and it needs, it really needs the consumer to make the change because otherwise the supermarket, 
supermarkets will continue doing what they're doing because they're a business. And I get it. Like, as much as I could rant and rave about what I think, they are a business and they have KPIs and they have to mm. do things to, to deliver what the cu- customer wants, you know. And, um, you know, I'll rant and rave about buying canals and bananas um, because, you know, they're chemical free, they're local, you know, and say to people, buy canals and bananas. But most people don't even know the difference. And it's quite easy. Canals and bananas are small, Queensland bananas are huge. And they're sprayed, you know, God knows how many times a day because mm. they have so many um, pests over there. As well as travelled across two times. As well as travelled, yeah, exactly. So, you know, going back to, you know, like the cooking, I mean, I love cooking, I will always be a chef, but the direction I'm going in now is being able to facilitate these team buildings, being able to make a difference on on food waste. That's that's the pathway I'm mm. going now. Through, through the programmes you're offering. Yeah, well, just just as a just as a human being, like that's that's where I see my power um, being, and I don't know where it's going to end up, but it's definitely something I'm really passionate about. And you is know, it something that's always been there, or is it just recently bubbled up? It's grown. Yeah, it's grown. Mm. I mean, that as a chef, you you're very aware of food waste because. Um, it, you know, in, in a business, you try and keep your food waste minimal, etc. But um, but it's it's very clear how much does get wasted, and um, but then there's no easy answer. Mm. There's a lot of people just kind of go, oh yeah, but you know they should do this, that, and the other. Well, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to mm. who's going to spend the time doing that? And um, and does it is it actually going to work? So yeah, mm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Um, I, I noticed on whilst reading your through your website mm. talking about meal time and it's sort of mm. standing in the everyday. I mean, I I grew up where evening meal was a family thing, mm. and um, particularly Sunday lunch was quite a big family thing, quite a sociable thing because we mm. frequently have people coming over and what have you, and. Um, Seldom with the TVs on, obviously we didn't have devices yeah. and stuff like that. Do you, what are your thoughts on this? Do you still see meal time being more than just refueling or? or? Uh, look, um, I get quite emotional about this. You know, my, even when I go home now, mum and dad have got a big round wooden table in the kitchen and my favourite thing is getting up in the morning and we sit around the table and have a cup of tea and talk about life mm. and dinner's always you know I mean mum and dad just put the whole La Cruze pot in the middle of the table and you dish up yourself and um, it's a place for conversation and you know that we get so stuck in our heads with what's going on in our lives and we don't talk about stuff enough and I know that every problem could always be solved around the family dinner table and um, you know when I go home now my brother comes over with, with my little niece Bonnie and um, and you know seeing her just eat everything she eats all her veggies and it's just it for me it's how meal time should be and um, and kids are so distracted by TV and video games and um, it's not just being, kids though is it yeah okay true <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah and look I'm I'm addicted to my phone like I. I find it very hard to switch off, but, you know, like something happened at the studio today and I had to, if I wasn't on my phone, there would have been an impact with the people that were there and and all of that. So that's kind of like I'm always available. But um, it's amazing seeing how many parents or how many people we are just glued to our phones and you can get everything there and and, um, even... Yeah, from young babies, the parents aren't looking at the babies anymore. They're looking at, you know, yeah. swiping on their phone, and um, and that's going to have massive impact down the line. You know, the the biggest biggest stories we hold from our childhood is like, I'm not loved, I'm not good enough, and and all of that. And kids are growing up with mum and dad just being completely distracted by TVs and phones and everything that you know 
brought some messages. Yeah, they? yeah. And it's not it's not an intentional, it's not saying we're like, bad parents. I mean, I'm not a parent, so I can't say. Yeah. But um, I know that, you know, mum and dad, there was always, you know, always there for conversation at the end of the day and um, communication and, yeah, yeah, I'm going home in a few weeks. I'm like, can't wait to get my conversation cup, on. cup of tea in the morning. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think one of the things I find now, and it's an interesting point you raised, is that there's not a lot that can't be solved with a conversation with mm. your family or your friends in the dinner tables. I mean, you know, if you go to somewhere like France or Italy, um, oh, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a big thing. You're yeah. there for an hour, an hour and a half, this discussion and mm. this, that and the other. Um, yeah, so often we're you know, glued to phones and stuff mm. and not really expanding ideas and problems yeah. and anxieties that are going on in our head. Mm. Well, look, everything can be resolved in communication <laughs> and we think that it can't. Yeah. We think that, you know, all of the, like, as you know, I do a lot of landmark, there's so much okay. that's made up in our heads about stuff. And when you actually communicate it and go, you know, from what you just said, I took it as this, and, and how we deal with stuff is from our past experiences. So, and the classic is, um, you know, a, part, a woman and a man saying, um, talking to each other and, and and he says something and she hears it as something else and then reacts to that. And and it's just, it, so much is just, we're crazy. Human beings are just full of crazy thoughts. Crazy thoughts? Yeah. When you actually go, when you actually communicate it and say, oh, that made me feel like that, then the other person goes, oh, my God, I didn't mean it like that. You know, and then it's just dealt with. Yes. But we don't. We we have a reaction and going, you fucking... Mm. <laughs> And then go and have a sulk for five days about it. And the, yes. the other person's like, I don't know what I said, what I did. And How did that come about? Yeah, maybe there wasn't even anything wrong or horrible. But, you know, we all have our own little triggers and, and yeah. stuff like that. You mentioned so, Landmark. Tell me a bit more. What is Landmark for people who don't know? Um, uh, so they run programs um, all over the world. And I did the Landmark Forum, which is their first three and a half day program. Five and a half years ago, my accountant said, go and do the forum. And I did it. And, um, and what do you do on, on the forum? Sit there what? in a chair. Someone stands at the front and leads it, the forum leader. You talk to the person next to you. If you want to, you can go up to a microphone. And um, it's all about you, your life, what's important to you. And right. In the forum, you deal with um, all of the stuff that's happened in your past, how it's impacting you now. And by the Sunday evening, you get that all of your past can stay in the past and that you can create anything with your life based on who you are now, not with the eight-year-old decision of I'm stupid or, you know, the five-year-old I'm not good enough or all of that, I'm unlovable, all of that stuff. That's powerful stuff. The reactions still come, but you get to see them rather than they run you. You know, and I've, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. I've dealt with a lot of you know the emotional reactions in life and really had kind of was like cool I'm doing doing all right and then the, what the area I hadn't been working on so much lately is in relationships so you know some stuff happened with my dad a few years ago um where I was like can't trust men and you know and had a lot of proof about it you know my dad lied about quite a lot of stuff and, um, you know, all my past relationships as well, I had a lot of evidence around that. So right. I've just been like, I'm going to... So you've got a belief in there somewhere. Yeah, and you I've just got spotted a all the evidence whole out pocket of stuff. But I shut that door and went, I'm going to be single because that's easier. So I've been single and doing my thing and just rocking through life. And then I met someone a few weeks ago and opened up that can of worms. And I'm just like, stuff will happen. And I have this like... You know the emotion and the upset and that's what i'm saying like i'll just go do you know what you just said i reacted to it you know and i got upset about it and he's like but why i'm like well because my ex did this and it was along the same line like and it, it's not even the same thing but i'm talking about it and he's like you're crazy that's nuts i didn't mean that I'm like, and you're still together yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and so yeah and that's you know, I, I look back to when I was a reaction to everything in my life and I get upset about so much stuff and with all the bullying as well, like so yeah. much fear of what people thought of me and 
you know, when I was at, at secondary school, I had short blonde hair and it was like around my face. And if people spoke, spoke to me, I'd go bright red. And now I'm, it put me in front of 2,000 people right. and I'll talk. I love it. I love being in front of people. It's a, it's a massive, massive shift. This is, this is awesome because um, one, one of the reasons why I set up WA Real is, is to listen to people's stories and listen mm. to, to what they've got to tell themselves. And I have this intrinsic, I have a tr- I have an intrinsic belief that our beliefs mm. completely shape everything. That mm. We get right down to how we perceive the situation, what all the information we take on board and the information mm. we leave out to shape that. And um, yeah, I, I've had a couple of guests already who things have happened to them and they could have chosen it one way, mm. they chose to look at it one way or another. And it's ultimately, what's the belief underneath? Mm. And and by not, I almost feel like it's in, intrinsically important that each individual spends an amount of time, probably each day, mm. considering this, even five or ten minutes, because otherwise these programs are controlling mm. you. I love the analogy. I love Djokovic. Like, so we use him as a tennis player. So he's standing on the court and a, a tennis ball comes flying at him at, I don't know what speed they come, they're real fast. Yeah, 140, and, 50 miles an hour, yeah. something like that. So he positions his body and his racket and he moves and he gets his racket in the perfect position to hit that ball as fast and as hard as possible to score a point. Now that ball to him is an opportunity. I'm standing there, that ball's coming at me at 140 k's now. I'm like, shit, I'm out of here because that ball is a threat and it's going to hurt me and I run. Yeah. So if you look at that ball as life, you can take life as a threat and a fear or you can take it as an opportunity. So when stuff comes at you, you can go, okay, well, you know, like my van, it's not a great story. Yeah. But I can either get really miserable about it and cry or I can take action after action after action and look at it as an opportunity to learn something. I'm not quite sure what I've learned from it yet, but, you know, take it as, <laughs> as a lesson. And, um, and with, the, with the failures, we grow. And the best thing is to, to look at, I am not a failure. This, like, skin sack is not a failure. The action I took is a failure. And I will learn not to take that action again. And it's so simple because we walk around like, I'm a big failure. And that's just the way I am. Well, you get to say who you are. And you define you yourself choose. by the stories you tell yourself. Yeah. Mm. That's powerful. Love it. <laughs> Love it. So a couple of questions for you. Mm. So what does success look like for Sophie going forward? Okay. So I was talking about this yesterday. See, money is not... Money would be helpful, but all I want from life is I want to be, be able to afford to go back and forth to England to see my family a couple of times a year and to be able to fly them over here. I'd like to have a little place that, you know, I can call home that has all my crap in because I have lots of crap. And, um, you know, I want... Um, the next stage is like the brand Sophie but like like I'll let you on a, on a secret I want to be the next Jamie Oliver I don't know what that looks like but I want to use my skills and my knowledge and everything that I'm good at to make a bigger difference you know I, right. I love it beyond here. beyond cooking, yeah cooking chef in. yeah I can cook yeah but you know the team building I'm doing imagine if that was in every city around the world yeah. That's kind of, that's what... That'd be awesome. That's what I'm about. Like, how do I do that? Scale up. I don't know. But I'm going to have a go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and, um, and educating people and, you know, and yeah, Jamie Oliver changed my life and has inspired me. He inspires me every day. Um, and I want to be like him. I want to be like him and make... What, what are the key, impact. like, two, three, four things? That means be like Jamie Oliver. What does that mean to you? Um, have people wake up to what they're actually putting in their bodies mm-hmm. and to be educated because so many people are uneducated and they don't get it. Um, what else? I think that that power that he has over that people listen to him, I think that's magical and there's 
there's just an energy about him. I love it. And, and even just being in his company, like he's just an incredible human being and, but it's, it's so natural. He doesn't put on an act. He's not, you know, he, he does all right, tiger. And you know, that's <laughs> what comes out of his mouth. He says pucker all the time. Um, so that, and, um, I don't know. Good question. Is two enough? <laughs> Dudley. Dudley. Oh, food for thought. <laughs> what keeps Sophie awake at night? Other than the van. <laughs> yeah, fucking van. Um, uh, I forget stuff a lot. I'll wake up and go, oh, got to buy leaks. And I'll leave a note for myself and a reminder. But generally, I sleep quite well at the moment. Right. Yeah. But, you know, money is always a stress. I've, you know, the business two years ago was not great and um, I've definitely turned it around big time, but at the same time it's still, you know, it's still always pretty tight and it's, um, but how I'm being about it has changed. The end of last year I was just like a big crying heap about everything and now I'm just like, okay, well, what, what can I do today that will impact that? And so it really, yeah. Don't really, really worry about that too right. much. What does um, what is it that you do that when things get hectic or you're exhausted? What are the things that you do which helps to sort of ground yourself and bring yourself back, mm -hmm. a sense of calm and, and and being present with yourself? I take my dog to the beach. Mm. Yeah, just me and him. I do go with friends sometimes, but I love just going with him and. Go down to Peace Home in Scarborough and walk all the way up to the pipe and back again. And yeah, he's my best buddy, my dog. And cool. um, yeah, he's very grounding and uh, he can tell when I'm upset. And he's, yeah, he's cool. Um, and just be, be with, uh, I, I love, I do love being on my own, but being with good, good people, good friends. And, um, having real conversations. Awesome. Mm. If you could go back and, and give a few nuggets of advice mm. to Sophie before she started at that college course or before she mm -hmm. turned up, at, you know, in that, at those whites, what, what, what would you tell her? Um. Knowing what you know now. Do you know what? I'm going to say nothing because the whole journey has made me who I am. And I think that, you know, I can look back and say, I've been great for having been bullied. I'm glad I was bullied because it made me who I am. And um, <clears throat> probably some money advice, like, <laughs> yeah, numbers and me. My dad's a super, like, he can do long divisions in his head. And um, so probably understanding money a bit more in spreadsheets. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> For the person out there that's listening to this podcast mm. who's 16, 17, 18, 19, and they're thinking, oh, yeah, mm. chefing, cooking, food. What sort of advice would you give them considering a career ahead of them? Um, do some work experience you know, work for nothing, do a kitchen hand job for a couple of weeks in your holidays, get immersed in it, find a good kitchen though. Um, and I think in WA that most of the chefs I know are just amazing. There's a real, really, it's a good place to, to learn. Um, and just, yeah, try it, see if you like it. Um, because it isn't for everybody and you've got to be passionate to be a chef. Um, it's not like it is on the TV. I met a guy the other day who was on, you know, Master Chef, and I know a, a couple of my staff have been on Master Chef, and the the glamour and the and everything that's on the TV ain't nothing like a kitchen. You know, you're <laughs> sweaty, you smell like you put makeup on, it falls off your face within ten minutes. You cut your finger, you burn yourself. Everyone swears at each other. You get stuff thrown at you. You're exhausted, you've had enough, and you just, yeah, it's it's not that glamorous, but I love it. You know, you watch watch Marco Pierre White, yeah. and that's like in that crazy, in the middle of service, 
that's that's the gold is that's when you, gold, you don't know one. which end is up and you've got checks everywhere and you're just cooking like crazy and you just get everything done on time and then that last check goes off the board and then you clean down your section you go and have a beer with the chefs that's the that's the gold that's and the you gold. go back and you do it all over you again <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome and uh Finally, what was the best bit of advice you've ever received? Oh, do you know? I think it was from that first chef when he said, "Don't go home till the kitchen's clean," James. Because that was, um, I really got it. Like I got it, and I, when I did it, and then I got that. It was like acceptance. There was a bit of a test, like the new girl, how's she going to stand? And yeah, I think that's it. And because it was so early on, it made such a big difference and it shaped me into to who I am as well. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, Sophie, I, I just want to acknowledge you for, for today. It's been awesome. You've been super open and honest about um, your journey, about your business, about all of it. Um, you know, there's just so much in there. I think it's um, it, it's been awesome, um, and I've really, really enjoyed having you Thank on the you. show. You know, um, WA Real is is about finding yourself in real stories, mm -hmm. and I think there's you know wh whether you're interested in cooking and chefing or not, there's just been so much in this story that people can take away. <laughs> Everyone, stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it works. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>